In previous lecture, we have seen how the fluid film bearing imparts instability in the rotor bearing system. Uh, today, we will uh, take up to uh, another kind of damping, one is internal damping and another is a symmetric shaft and because of these two uh, cases, how the instability comes into the rotor system, we will try to study. Uh, in this uh, internal damping, uh, we will see how it uh, comes into the system initially and then uh, we will with simple mathematical model, we will try to analyze uh, this instability in which we will find that uh, there will be a threshold uh, speed above which uh, instability can occur. And uh, for a symmetrical shaft case, we will see <coughs> there will be a band of uh, instability zone where uh, the rotor can be unstable and below and above the these bands, we will find that uh, there will be stable uh, system. So, before going into detail, just let us see what we will be covering here. So, instability in rotor system with internal damping and uh, with asymmetrical shaft and we will see that internal damping or material damping or sometime we call it as hysteretic damping, how it comes into the system and uh, this asymmetrical shaft stiffness uh, rotor model we will see how we can able to analyze with this uh, the instability in the rotor system. So, coming to the uh, in internal damping which is uh, which comes from various sources like elastic hysteretic uh, of shaft material uh, due to flexural vibration of the shaft the intermolecular interaction take place within the shaft material and that gives some kind of uh, heat generation within the shaft material. So, basically this kinetic energy converts into the uh, heat in the form of hysteresis. Uh, even in the shaft uh, during the flexural vibration, the inside fiber uh, shear take place uh, during whirling. Uh, because of tension and compression of the fiber uh, and apart from this frictional forces between two mating parts with in interference fit uh, can have this kind of uh, internal damping. So, in this particular case all such damping sources uh, can impart a common damping which we call as internal damping. This internal damping is having <coughs> slightly different characteristic as compared to the viscous damping. Uh, so, <coughs> like uh, le let us understand the internal damping when we have one shaft and there is a hub or disc and this ring fit on this. So, during vibration or whirling uh, this shaft bends and uh, because of the compression here already. Uh, onto the shaft because of interference and during the bending we will see that the upper fiber of the shaft will elongate and the lower one will get compressed and this forces will resist that particular motion uh, extension of the shaft or contraction of the shaft and this gives internal damping between two mating parts having some kind of interference fit. Now, coming to the difference between the hysteretic damping and the viscous damping, uh, internal damping force which is nothing but hysteretic damping is proportional to the rate of shaft deformation uh, and but the viscous damping is proportional to the absolute velocity of the uh, rotor. So, one is rate of shaft deformation and another uh, damping force is proportional to the absolute velocity of the rotor. And because this internal damping, because of this internal damping direction changes along with the shaft rotation, it is convenient to analyze the internal damping in rotating coordinate system. So, now we will analyze the internal damping uh, with a very simple mathematical model of rotor system 
and uh, in this particular case we will derive the equation of motion in rotating coordinate system and uh, uh, once we uh, obtain the equation of motion in rotating coordinate system we will introduce the, the hysteretic damping or internal damping at that stage. So, initially the equation of motion will be deriving only with the internal damp or that is only with the viscous damping and subsequently we will be introducing the hysteretic damping. So, before going to the equation of motion let us see the let us see the rotating coordinate system and its transformation. So, x y is stationary coordinate system, uh, xi and eta is rotating coordinate system and we want to transform uh, the equation of motion in x y uh, axis coordinate system to the, the rotating coordinate system. Uh, before that we can able to relate these two coordinate system. So, with elementary geometry we can able to relate that uh, here we can able to see <coughs> this is the center of the shaft and here O d is the x distance, O f is the y distance and similarly O h is the xi uh, O e is the xi distance and O g is the eta distance. We need to uh, relate these two coordinates that means, we have x and y the geomet uh, geometrical center of the shaft is the coordinate of the geometrical center of the shaft in x and y coordinate and another is xi and eta we need to relate these two. So, you can able to see with simple geometry we can able to write x is equal to xi cos omega t minus nu sin omega t. This omega t is the angle at particular time t of the rotating coordinate system at t time is equal to 0 we can assume that both coordinates are in the same position, but after as time passes this rotating coordinate system rotates with the spin speed of the shaft. Similarly, y can be related as xi sin omega t plus eta cos omega t this are standard uh, trigonometry relations. Now, we are defining a complex displacement s which is defined as x plus j y, j is the co uh, complex quantity uh, that is root of. In the rotating coordinate system similarly, we are defining zeta is equal to xi plus j eta, s and xi are the complex uh, coordinates in stationary coordinate and rotating coordinate system. Now, uh, these two uh, in place of x and y from previous expression we can able to write uh, this in terms of zeta xi and eta and similarly y we can able to write in terms of these two and this we can able to rearrange by taking common of xi term and eta term and we can able to see within the this bracket is e j omega t and this if we take common uh, i this can be converted into uh, j e j omega t and here you can able to see this in this uh, e j omega t is common. So, that can be taken out. So, xi plus j eta and xi plus j eta is nothing but zeta here. So, that can be substituted. So, this is the transformation basically in complex domain from stationary coordinate system to rotating coordinate system and this will be using uh, to transform the equation of motion uh, of the rotor system. Uh, because we will be having derivatives of the uh, this complex displacement in the equation of motion. So, we can able to take the derivative with respect to time because zeta and this both are time dependent. So, once we differentiate we will get two components two parts. So, first de derivative and then derivative of the second term this can be clubbed like this. Similarly, if we take another derivative of this we will be having derivative of this and then we will be getting basically four terms. Uh, so, these are the four terms um, after differentiation of this which can be simplified. Uh, as this because two terms are common. So, they will add up to give this. So, we have 
complex displacement in stationary coordinate system and its derivative uh, we have already obtained. Now, let us see the equation of motion of a simple rotor system in which we have mass of the rotor, uh, viscous damping which may come from bearing or any other source and k is the stiffness of the shaft. So, this is the equation of motion in the uh, horizontal direction. Similarly, this is the equation of motion in the vertical direction. In this case, we have not considered any cross coupling of the stiffness or damping, only simple direct stiffness and damping we have considered. C v is the viscous damping. At present, we have not introduced the hysteretic damping. As I told earlier, once we will transform this equation of motion in the rotating coordinate system, then we will introduce the uh, viscous damping, because it will be convenient to introduce at that at, at that stage. So, now we are uh, we are multiplying the second equation by j adding it to 1 first equation. So, we can able to get the equation of motion in a complex domain in stationary coordinate system. So, m s double dot plus c v s dot plus k s is equal to 0. Now, we can able to substitute the transformation which we developed in the previous slides. So, s double dot we obtained earlier. So, this is the s double dot s dot two terms was there. So, this is the s and s in terms of zeta. So, basically this equation of motion after substituting the transformation now it has come into the rotating coordinate system, because now here it is in the terms of zeta that is in the rotating coordinate system complex uh, coordinate. And because zeta is defined as xi plus j eta. So, we can able to split this equation in real part and imaginary part with the help of this expression. So, in, in the direction of xi we will get this equation. We can see that j, uh, j term is there. So, that will give basically after multiplying this eta term here. Otherwise, xi terms will be there at any other place. Wherever j is there, we will be getting the eta term and plus and minus sign we need to take care of that. And this is as it is only a real part we have considered. So, this is the real part and this is the imaginary part of the this complex equation. So, this equation is in the direction of xi and this is the equation of motion of the rotor in the eta direction. Now, uh, coming to the hysteretic damping here, this is the xi direction, this is the eta direction. We have earlier noted that the hysteretic damping or internal damping is it acts proportional to the uh, that is rate of deformation of the uh, shaft, because this coordinate system xi and eta is attached to the root is rotating with the spin speed. So, the rate of deformation of the shaft will be xi dot and eta dot and if we multiply with static damping coefficient this will give the damping force static internal damping force in the direction of xi and in the direction of eta. So, now you can able to see that because we have already derive the equation of motion in the xi direction and eta direction. And if we want to include the hysteretic damping, we just need to include these two terms in the previous equation of motion. So, this equation of motion is exactly same only thing now we have added this hysteretic damping in this model. So, this equation is exactly same only thing now additional term of the hysteretic damping C h we added. C v is already there in, the, in this. Now, this equation is ready for an, uh, for doing the stability analysis of the system. So, again we will combine these two equations. That means, the second equation will multiply by j and add it to 1 first equation. So, again we can get the equation of motion in the uh, rotating complex coordinate system that is zeta. And all other terms are similar only the additional term you can able to see is coming due to the hysteretic damping. This was already there and now 
we can able to yeah, because we have some terms of zeta dot and zeta. So, we can able to rearrange this equation. So, that we have terms of zeta double dot in one place, zeta dot in another place and zeta another place. So, now we can able to assume the solution of this in this form in which zeta naught is a complex world amplitude in rotating coordinate system g uh, lambda naught t lambda naught is the relative world frequency or eigen value of the system this is relative because we are uh, assuming the solution in the rotating coordinate system the absolute world frequency is will be and the relative frequency will be defined like this that means because the difference is at which this particular rotating system is rotating so relative world uh, world frequency or the eigen value is defined as absolute world frequency minus the speed so with this we can able to get the uh, with this relation we can able to get the absolute world frequency also so the assumed solution uh, will be substituting in the equation of motion in the rotating coordinate system itself for that we need derivatives of the zeta and zeta double dot uh, so we can able to substitute this in equation of motion and with that we'll get a polynomial in the lambda naught square so you can able to see this is a polynomial in lambda naught square this square the quadratic polynomial and the form of this polynomial because is slightly different as compared to the previous case of the damping the fluid from bearing damping case you can able to see some complex terms are also there so basically more general form of this quadratic equation could be like this in which the real part and imaginary part of the epsilon is uh, this lambda square term is there similarly for uh, lambda lambda naught term and for the constant term so this is a more general form of this so stability criteria for this equation uh, are provided in the next slide so this is the stability criteria rout velvet's stability criteria uh, for a polynomial with co complex coefficients so this is the determinant should be minus of this should be greater than 0 so if we compare these two equation we can able to see that a naught is minus m and b naught is 0. So, like that we can able to compare these two equation and we can able to get the this a and b coefficients and if we substitute this here from first determinant we will get c h plus c v is equal should be greater than 0 this is the one condition. Second criteria is this one. So, if we substitute various coefficients and if we simplify this we will get expression like this which in which we have defined the omega n f square as k by m and in turn this can be written as omega square less than uh, this quantity and because this ratio is generally small. So, this can be neglected. So, if we neglect this uh, we will get basically we take the square root the speed when it is less than this quantity will be having system stable that means uh, when there is no damping in the system so when the speed is less than the natural frequency undamped natural frequency of the system will be having stability but if there is a viscous damping in the system and this then uh, the stability sp because this factor will be positive and so the total factor will be more than 1. So, we see that with the damping the stability uh, the speed uh, below which the, the system is stable increases and especially if we increase the viscous damping in the system we can able to increase the stability of the system uh, by some amount. So, from this we can able to see that the system is always stable even in the presence of hysteretic damping below the critical speed. So, that we already seen that if below the critical speed there is no instability and the presence of viscous damping this one 
uh, has the effect of raising the speed at which the system become unstable. So, if we can provide more damp viscous damping in the system by in the form of vis the damper or the uh, in the bearing, uh, we can have this uh, instability uh, speed we can able to raise up to certain uh, level. Now, through a simple example, we will see that uh, how we can able to uh, analyze uh, by numerical integration this kind of kind of instability. So, basically we will be integrating this kind of equation of motion for various uh, speeds and we will try to see the response how it uh, uh, changes especially if you are giving some small disturbance how the uh, response uh, changes uh, and we will be solving this for without any external uh, excitation. So, this is the problem in which we are considering a Jeffcott rotor of mass is given, diameter of the shaft is given, length is given and uh, the viscous damping and hysteretic damping ratio let us say we are assuming as is 0.2 and viscous damping ratio of the system that zeta uh, is 0 0.01 this is the damping ratio for the shaft uh, the material property like uh, E is given here. Uh, now, we want to obtain the response in time domain or the orbit plot for some initial condition at various speeds this is the undamped natural frequency. So, at various speeds we will be obtaining this plots and we will see how it behaves. So, coming to the equation of motion in the rotating coordinate system this was the equation of motion with the hysteretic damping. Uh, we chose the yeah, here in the transformation from the rotating to this uh, stationary coordinate system will be uh, just opposite. We So, if we take the derivative of this we will get this and the second derivative we will give this. If you substitute this in equation of motion we will get back the equation of motion in the stationary coordinate system uh, like this. So, you can able to see this is the additional term which is coming because of the hysteretic damping other terms were there in the equation of motion. Now, we can able to take the real part of this and imaginary part of this to get the uh, this two equation because we define the s is equal to x plus j y. So, this is the equation of motion in the x direction and this is in the y direction. Now, you can able to see there is hysteretic damping uh, terms coming uh, in this places and not only it is coming here, but here also it is coming and is these two equations are now uh, coupled because in x direction y term is also coming because of internal damping and also in this we have uh, x, x term in the y direction. So, to solve this equation by direct integration method uh, obviously, we need to solve these two equations simultaneously. We can use uh, any numerical integration method and uh, uh, this is the displacement with time when we are considering the speed is equal to 0.2 of the natural frequency of the system and because there is no excitation in the system. So, we have given some initial condition. So, that uh, in once we uh, disturb the system we will see that it stabilizes after some time. Uh, th this is the orbit plot that means, x direction and y direction displacement plot with respect to time. So, we are given some initial disturbance. So, this is the initial uh, condition from here we are leave uh, we are leaving the rotor. So, it is going uh, like this and is trying to stabilize. So, this is for very short duration uh, of time, but if we take more time uh, we can see that we started from here and gradually it is converging toward this point. So, because here clarity is not there. So, initially we showed this for very short duration how it goes, but it after some time it goes to here as we have seen in the uh, very first slide also after some time it goes to the stable solution. So, this is for one of the speed 
Now, when we are close to the natural frequency, uh, this is the for a given disturbance, this kind of uh, here again is going toward the lesser amplitude. So, it looks the system is stable. This is the orbit plot. So, this is for very short duration, but if we take long time, then gradually you will see that is going toward the stable zone. Similarly, at different speed we have tried like 1.6 times the natural frequency. So, in this case also is stabilizes. So, this is for short duration, this is the initial condition and then it comes like this, but for long duration. Uh, so, gradually it is um, converging to uh, station, uh, steady state solution. Then if we take uh, omega is equal to 1.6, then we found that the system is unstable for a given initial disturbance, the amplitude grows <coughs> with time. Here also cannabolo C uh, is gradually increasing. So, this is the orbit plot. So, this condition is giving us the instability uh, when we are operating the rotor at 1.2 times this. So, we have seen that uh, this particular instability is always occurs above the natural frequency of the system and not necessary at all uh, speed above the natural frequency, but at some of the speeds this instability can occur that we have demonstrated here. Now, we will take another case in which uh, the rotor is having the shaft is having a symmetry that means, it has uh, shaft is stiffness different in two principal direction. Generally in rotors uh, especially in generators we find that uh, we cut some kind of grooves uh, for providing the windings and those uh, are not symmetrically placed uh, onto the rotor and because of that we have two principal directions uh, and uh, the stiffness varies in this two uh, principal direction and continuously basically it varies uh, when we rotate the rotor. So, this is a one particular a typical rotor of a of the generator in which you can see there are slots which are running axially and these are provided generally for uh, providing windings in the generator and here also it is there, but some part of the rotor is solid. So, we can expect that in this particular case the effective area of the shaft will be something like this because we have removed the material. So, it will be something like this and we expect that now because of this effective area uh, here depth and here are different. So, when rotor is having this orientation and this orientation first case and second case the stiffness let, let us say about one of the axis x x this will be uh, different as compared to this axis which is y y. So, here we expect the about this axis the stiffness will be uh, less as compared to this one. So, we expect because of its own weight the rotor will deflect more in this configuration than this configuration and generally to compensate the decrease in the stiffness some kind of slots are provided in the solid part which is called stiffness compensating slots. So, that we can able to uh, reduce the stiffness in this direction also, but even with that we have variation of the, the stiffness as the shaft rotates. So, we can able to see when it is having some different orientation we will be having change in the stiffness. So, basically for such system the stiffness changes with time and this particular behavior uh, gives uh, instability into the rotor system. Now, let us see this uh, if we attach a rotating coordinate system along the two principal direction of the rotor and if we analyze the rotate uh, equation of motion in this rotating coordinate system, then it will be convenient to analyze. So, here also we will be 
choosing the rotating coordinate system and we will be obtaining the equation of motion in the rotating coordinate system itself. And in fact, we will be defining the stiffness of the shaft in these two directions in the rotating coordinate system itself. This is the equation of motion. So, basically this is m x double dot and we have seen that x and zeta and uh, xi and eta how they are related earlier we have defined. So, basically this is the s double dot term and this sorry this is x double dot term and this one is the stiffness uh, in the xi direction and if you multiply by the xi displacement we will get the elastic force. So, basically this is the Newton's second law of motion in which this is the sum of external force in this particular case only the uh, stiffness force we are considering is equal to the inertia force. So, basically this whole term is x double dot, but it has been transformed to the rotating coordinate system and this we can able to write uh, like this, this is the rotating coordinate system equation of motion. Similarly, in the eta direction, this is the force, this is the elastic, uh, the shaft stiffness in the eta direction. Uh, now, you can able to see there are uh, the, the stiffness in two directions, two principal directions are different, uh, eta, psi and eta and this is basically y double dot transform into the rotating coordinate system. So, this is the equation of motion in the rotating coordinate system in the eta direction. So, we have two equations this and this in the rotating coordinate system. Now, we can able to assume the solution of this as amplitude and the frequency part uh, amplitude and frequency part. Here all uh, the lambda naught is again relative wall frequency or the, the uh, eigen value of the problem. Eta naught and uh, xi naught they are the complex amplitude in rotating coordinate system. So, these equations which we assumed uh, we need to substitute in this two equation. So, for that we need to take derivative of this with respect to uh, single derivative and double derivative. So, those things if we do it we will get the equation in this form. So, uh, because this will be common. So, this can be taken out similarly in the second. So, this is in the xi direction and this is in the eta direction. So, these are the two equation of motion. Uh, now, it has been converted into the basically frequency domain. They cannot be 0. So, uh, this they can be eliminated. So, the remaining term we can able to put in a in this form. So, basically uh, we are writing this in a matrix form in which as e, e, that is xi naught and eta naught is the this particular vector and all the coefficients of these in this equations are. So, this is coefficient of the eta naught in the first equation, this is uh, zeta naught uh, first equation, this is for the eta naught. Similarly, this is for the uh, zeta naught in the sorry xi naught in the first equation and eta naught in the uh, this equation. So, basically these two equations I have put in a uh, matrix form and this is homogeneous equation and for non trivial solution of this the determinant of this matrix should be 0 and that gives us a polynomial of this form quadratic polynomial in lambda naught square and in this particular case because this is a now polynomial with uh, the real coefficients. So, we know rao Hurwitz stability criteria. First criteria was that all the coefficients should have same sign. So, here we have 1. So, this is a positive. Here these terms are all square terms. So, they will be positive. Uh, this term should be positive then only we can have the stability. So, if this is positive that means, this should be basically this is the instability or instability this should be 0. If it is uh, below if it is less than 0 that means, the system this will be negative that means, system will be instable or unstable. So, this is the condition that for instability 
we will be having this condition. Now, in this we have defined this lambda naught oh sorry omega xi as root of k xi by m this is just terminology this is not a natural frequency. Similarly, this is another terminology. So, we have defined like this and the stiffness is such that omega xi is less than omega eta. So, the choice of the coordinate system is such that that we have this condition let us say. So, that means, uh, this is less than this and so, in this particular case if we see uh, there are three conditions possible when we have the speed. If uh, first case is when speed is less than omega xi. So, if this is the case we will see that this is less than this. So, this is positive and this also be positive. So, this will be no, this will not be satisfied that means, system will be stable. If this is satisfying we will be getting the unstable uh, condition. So, when both are positive this whole quantity is positive. So, that is not less than 0. So, we will be having stable solution. Second case when omega is more than omega xi, but omega is less than omega eta. In that case this is more than this. So, this quantity is negative, but this is less than this. So, this is positive. So, negative and positive becomes negative. That means, for this case the system will be unstable because now it is satisfying this condition and this is the condition. So, when omega is in this range we are finding that uh, this is becoming negative. Uh, the third condition is when speed is greater than omega eta then this is positive this is also positive. So, it is not satisfying the uh, this instability condition. So, that means only rotor will be unstable when it is operating between these two range and otherwise it will be stable. So, here we have seen that basically we are getting a band of uh, frequency range at which the system will be unstable, uh, but uh, beyond that band the system will be uh, stable. This particular uh, analysis we did by assuming that uh, whatever the vibrational frequency is there that is uh, same as the spin speed of the shaft, but vibrational frequency can be different as compared to spin speed of the shaft. So, for that particular case this the band which we obtained uh, earlier we took in this vibrational frequency is equal to spin speed of the shaft, but if we generalize. So, this vibrational frequency whenever is between these two band we will be having an instability and for a case of such system in which we have a symmetrical shaft in two principal directions we find that uh, during one rotation there will be twice the change of the stiffness would take place. So, that so if, if rotor is rotating we will find that the speed equal to twice of the uh, speed will be having uh, vibrational frequency because of the uh, this asymmetric shaft uh, property. And because of that uh, this nu will be 2 omega because the vibration frequency is twice for this case. Earlier case when we took uh, nu is equal to omega that could be because of uh, maybe uh, unbalance in the system because of that that kind of uh, frequency of vibration can take place, but this 2 omega would take place uh, in this particular case when we have the symmetrical shaft. Uh, so, from this we can able to see that we can divide throughout by 2. So, we will get this band also. So, when omega is between these two range also we will be having instability zone. So, apart from the previous one 
which was uh, this band. We have additional a band uh, in which we have unstable uh, vibrations and that is due to asymmetric property of the shaft and uh, because of that the whirling frequency itself is uh, twice the spin speed of the shaft. So, basically we, we are finding that this is one of the band in which the system will be unstable and there will be another band on which the uh, system will be unstable and we may find that these two bands may be uh, independent of each other or sometime they may overlap depending upon the values of this omega. So, uh, we will take up one uh, example in which uh, we will show this particular case in which we have asymmetrical uh, shaft how the instability uh, zones can be obtained. So, in this particular case we are taking a elliptical shaft with a length of 1 meter and the measure and measure and axis of the shafts are this. So, this may be due to the manufacturing defect this kind of geometry we may uh, get or sometimes may be the requirement of the system. Uh, the shaft carries a disc of this mass and the material property of the shaft is this. We need to find out the zone of instability in the rotor due to a symmetrical cross section of the shaft and because of this asymmetrical cross section will be having asymmetrical stiffness of the shaft. So, where is geometrical property we can able to obtain. So, this is the second moment of area uh, for elliptical shaft we can able to get in two principal directions and with that we can able to get uh, for the bonding condition of the problem the, the stiffness in two directions two principal directions we can able to obtain. So, there is slight deviation uh, because of the elliptical cross section in these two. Now, uh, these two parameter omega xi and omega eta can be obtained from as it has been defined. So, the range is this one uh, the omega xi is this and omega eta is this much. So, now as we analyze already that if the rotor is operating below this two speed range will be having unstable operation. So, one band of uh, un unstable operation will be from here to here and another one because of the twice the uh, twice the speed of the whirl frequency due to the asymmetric nature of the shaft stiffness half of this that means, this will be additional uh, zone where the system will be unstable. So, in the whole range if we want the amplitude versus this. So, we will be having two parameter this. So, this is 633 and this is 667. So, in this range system will be unstable similarly we will be having another band. So, 317 and 334 this will be another band in which the system will be unstable. So, and if we are operating in this region or in this region or above this we expect this system will be uh, stable. In the previous lecture we did the instability analysis of fluid film bearing uh, that was linearized case. If uh, we want to consider the nonlinear uh, bearing uh, fluid film fluid film forces then we need to use the Reynolds equation to obtain that. So, here uh, briefly I am outlining how the instability analysis can be done for fluid film force um, if nonlinearity we want to consider. So, in this particular case this is the rotor and this we have fluid film forces in two direction or uh, radial direction and the tangential direction uh, weight of the journal is here. Uh, this could be unbalanced force which is rotating with some uh, speed uh, and the position of the rotor is given as eccentricity and the altitude angle. Now, if we want to write the equation of motion of this uh, obviously, we can able to uh, balance the force in the radial direction and tangential direction. So, this is the force balance in the radial direction. So, this is the fluid film force in the radial direction, this is unbalanced force 
component of this in the radial direction will be cos psi. Uh, then uh, weight component of that in the, the radial direction because that is angle is phi cos phi is equal to the mass and the radial acceleration. So, this is due to the radial motion and this is due to the angular motion. So, this is a radial acceleration, this is centripetal acceleration. Similarly, we can able to write the force balance in the tangential direction. So, this is the fluid flow force in tangential, tangential direction, this is the unbalanced force, this is the weight component and this is the mass and the uh, acceleration in the tangential direction. So, this is due to the rotation and this is due to uh, basically this is Carlyle's component of acceleration because of radial motion and the uh, angular velocity. So, this equation of motion uh, only thing is this radial force and the tangential force from the fluid film need to obtain from the pressure of the fluid uh, like this. So, over the inside the surface of the uh, bearing from 0 to 2 pi angle and from the length of the bearing we need to integrate this pressure which uh, we can obtain this pressure we can able to obtain from the Reynolds equation. So, component of this uh, pressure is in the uh, radial direction and this cos theta we are measuring from this. So, this will give the force in the radial direction and the in the tangential direction and this equation of motion can be integrated with respect to time uh, for E r that is eccentricity ratio which is time dependent and for the altitude angle and we can plot let us say eccentricity ratio. So, if uh, for stable system if we uh, initial condition is somewhere here and after some time it stabilizes to the solid line uh, we can call the system as stable or even if or disturbing the rotor inside of this orbit should come to the solid elliptical path, then the system will be stable. For whatever the initial condition, uh, the system will stabilize. For unstable uh, case, the response E r uh, will increase uh, like this, this kind of thing we have seen in the case of static damping also. So, uh, by direct integration of the uh, response uh, the differential equation to get the response will give us uh, this kind of uh, uh, whether the system is stable or unstable. So, this is another way by which we can able to obtain the instability of the system especially when the fluid flow forces are nonlinear in nature. So, in today's lecture we consider uh, two three aspect initially we started with the internal damping and uh, we saw that how the internal damping can uh, provide uh, instability in the rotor system. Especially we saw the, uh, the role of uh, viscous damping when the internal damping is, is also there. The internal viscous damping basically uh, uh, stabilizes the system. So, if we are providing more viscous damping the system uh, the speed of threshold uh, instability threshold can be increased. And in the another case when we consider the shaft asymmetry we found that not a single speed, but a band of speed uh, at which the, the rotor can become unstable. That band of speed uh, below or above the, those bands the rotor uh, will be stable, but uh, that kind of bands may be there uh, at uh, uh, other reasons also as we have seen when we consider the two uh, uh, twice the speed of the rotor if some vibration components are there. So, the second band of unstable zone can also be there. Apart from that we have seen that if we want to consider the nonlinearity of the fluid film bearing, how we can able to obtain the system stability. Basically, we need to in time integrate the equation of motion and if the response is uh, increases continuously for a particular disturbance, we can able to uh, conclude that the system is stable or uh, unstable and if it is stabilizing to a particular orbit, uh, then we can able to say the system is stable. In the next class, we will take up some more uh, kind of instability in which uh, we can have the rotor uh, can go into the unbounded uh, response. That means, 
the system uh, may become uh, unstable because of other kind of flow. In the next class, we will see some other source of instability and we will try to analyze how the instability can uh, give uh, some kind of uh, unbounded response to the rotor system.